four, three. Hello, everybody. Welcome to an amazing episode of Wrestling with the Future. I'm your host, Angelo DeCipio, joined as I am by the happy haberdasher each and every week, Dan, the man, Sebastiano. Daniel, you're looking dapper tonight. I see we have a change of hats. This is a little different for you. PlayStation, talk to me about the hat tonight. Uh, well, uh, the uh, hat I was going to wear just wasn't fitting right, and this is my emergency desk hat. So, Well, I'll was- tell you what. It's interesting that you have the PlayStation hat on because we got a guy tonight that's quite the player. Uh, we're going to bring him in here in a, in a couple of minutes, but before we do, I want to tell everybody about some upcoming guests we've got, some returning guests, actually. Uh, uh, the return of Cowboy Scott Casey. And he'll be joining, actually, our guest tonight. So we're going to we're going to reunite Mansfield and Casey on Wrestling with the Future, and that will be a barn burner. I'm just going to let him have it, and you and I are going to sit back and drink coffee. <laughs> and uh, we got the return of Vince Russo. Lanny Poffo will be joining us again. Ron Fuller, <laughs> the Tennessee Stud. Oh. We just, we've got, a, it's a who's who of pro wrestling, I want to tell you. And uh, so tonight, let us bring in our <laughs> guest of honor for the evening. And Dan, he's been here before. And uh, tonight's show is part two with an old friend, an old school wrestling icon, television and movie producer and controversial figure in pro wrestling, the content and a lover, Eddie Mansfield. He was one of the leaders in trying to keep kayfabe alive back in the 1980s, along with people like Dr. D. David Schultz, while people like Vince McMahon Jr. and Hulk Hogan were trying to kill it. We will talk wrestling history, today's wrestling product, and just about anything else and everything that comes to mind. So tonight, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back, the continental lover, our friend, our buddy, Eddie Mansfield. Eddie, how you doing, baby? And how you doing? And Dan, how you doing? Hey, I'm in. I'm live and in color from Houston, Texas, where me you and the Cowboys sold out that Sam Houston Coliseum many, many times. And I'm I'm so glad to be back on the show. And hey, we'll rock the world with this one. Just let me know that. Oh, that brother, this is no ready. holds barred. Strap, you know, strap yourself in because it's going to be a one hell of a ride, baby. Absolutely. And, and I, I, and, and, hey, I wasn't hard to hear, Angelo, was I? That you got that nanny goat rider coming on, Scott Casey? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. I, you know, when I, yeah. when, 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 I was, when I was wrestling Scott Casey, I'd be riding down the road. We'd be going like to say, you know, like uh, Seguin or where, wherever the hell we were going. Yeah. And I look on the side of the road, and there's Scott Casey on a horse trying to lasso a nanny goat. Can you imagine? And and I used to tell all them cowboys here in Texas, I ain't seen a cowboy since I hit Texas, you know? And well, I heard that, that story, Eddie. <laughs> yeah, listen, I got to ask you a question. You know, it's funny because, you know, it's funny how things happen. I'm I'm sitting today watching some of our old shows. And I saw a show that we did, Dan and I did, with uh, Karen McDaniel. And I got to ask you, I didn't even begin to scratch the surface of your stories with Wahoo. So so I want to get into a little bit, because Dan and I love Wahoo. He's one of our favorite subjects in the show. And yeah, we love well, Karen. I love Wahoo too. I, oh I my loved God, him Karen is well, a, you know. Yeah, well, Karen's a dear friend of the show, you know, uh, Karen McDaniel, Wahoo's wife. And uh, so, Absolutely. go ahead, Dan. Why don't you, you and Eddie talk to, talk a little Wahoo? Yeah, Eddie. Uh, the we had Scott on, and and I was asking how he was telling us some stories. So I'm curious. Wahoo was famous for his his antics on the road. Do you have any good uh-huh. uh, any good road stories from from your time with Wahoo? Oh, there's so many. It's unbelievable. From well, us shooting deer and throwing them in a, in a trunk to, to, you know, it's like, you know, Cowboy Scott Casey, he'd come in, you know, crying like the wimp he is. He would cry. <laughs> and, and it, it, you know, and he, he would look at Wahoo, and Wahoo would look at him and say, if you're looking for sympathy, uh, you know, sympathy is alphabetically in between shit and simplest. 
So I don't look for sympathy here. And, and you know, it, it's so true. And let me tell you, Scott Casey was probably one of the, the most underrated wrestlers in the history of the business. That's that guy, me and, absolutely. Absolutely. Me and, me and that cowboy could sell out any arena in any town, anywhere. There was professional wrestling was on the marquee. Because Cowboy Scott Casey and Eddie Mansfield was like two Brahma bulls. You never knew who was going to win. You never knew. And all the girls loved me, but they always cheered for him. And I couldn't get it, you know. <laughs> well, you I, would know always do so- I would always do something to piss them off. You know, because I was 230 pounds of twisted still in sex appeal and man. a rich woman's lover and a poor girl's dream. I mean, and this guy ain't nothing but a damn nanny goat rider. So what the hell, what am I missing here, you know? Well, let me ask you a question. I heard that when you and Cowboy used to go round and round, they used to raise the ticket prices down there. Well, they had to, man, because, you know, bottom line is they had to to pay Scott and myself. Yeah. And, you know, and the chief had to get his cut. And so between us three, you know, they had to pay us. And, oh, and, that's right. Yeah, we forgot that Wahoo was a booker for a lot of this stuff. Let me tell you something. Wahoo, McDaniel, Scott Casey, and myself are the ones who popped Southwest Championship Wrestling. And I'm going to give you a little history right now. There you go. Uh, on, on a weekend, uh, Wahoo, McDaniel, and myself, they uh, Wahoo had stolen me from Atlanta to get me out of Atlanta to come to uh, Southwest. Right. And so uh, the chief and myself were the first guys in the history of pro wrestling to be on, on two nationally syndicated programs on the same weekend. One was TBS at 6.05. And the the following right. morning at ten thirty, I think at ten thirty on USA Network. Yeah, you we, are we, absolutely we're right. The, you know so what, people, Eddie? I, I'm glad you mentioned that. I forgot about that. I yeah. forgot. I forgot about that. You're absolutely yeah, right. And, and and you know that's that's something I really treasure because it, it, it's never been done before. Yeah, and, and I was be, I was able to do it with with the chief, and you know the chief was one of the greatest athletes that that ever was in a, in the squared circle, and yeah, and and same with with Scott Casey. They could say they could say what they want about Scott, right? And people can say what they want about me or Wahoo, but the bottom line is we put asses eighteen inches between each other. And sold out everywhere we yeah. ever went, me and Scott Casey. True, absolutely true. Uh, Eddie, what, you've worked that that loop there around uh, the the Southwest Territory for quite some time, all the way into Florida. You you knew Eddie and Mike Graham. Um, that those names have come up a lot on the show, Eddie and yeah. Mike Graham. Um, I want to talk. Let me you tell got, you a story. Uh, real are you quick. okay talking Let about Eddie? A... Are, are hey, you what? okay talking about Eddie? Because I mean, a lot of people are touchy about talking about Eddie Graham. I don't give a shit about talking about Eddie Graham. I don't All give a right, shit well, about talking about Mike Graham. It doesn't matter to me, you know. Okay. Well, and I'm not. That, that's cool with me. The, I, it's funny because hey, let me tell you something. I, I was a television champion. They put that on me the first day I was there. Right. Yeah, and I told my dear friend, the late great Jack Briscoe, and I was I was shooting an angle with with uh, Jerry Briscoe, and the houses was starting to come up, but the problem was the paycheck sucked, right? Yeah. And so I I I just had to I, I walked in and I said, you know, I said I can't stay here much longer, and they get uh, Jack says, please don't leave, and I said, well, Jack, I said, shit, my paycheck don't even cover my bar bill. I said, we got a problem. <laughs> and, and, and so I'll never forget. Now, now this, this, I got to tell you this story. This, this is a few years, but right before then, 
that that Harley Race asked me. No, it was right out of Tampa. I think it was right out of Tampa. He asked me, "Would you go into Kansas City and and shoot a hot angle with with uh, uh, George Wells and and you know try to try to get the territory going?" And I looked at him. I said, "Are you going to be there?" He goes, "Yeah, I'll be there." Well, he was only there one day, and so I swear to you, by the second week, true true words are never spoken. And so I walked in, you know, I, I I got my paycheck and I went, hmm, okay. So I, I so so the next morning I walked in the office. You know, Terry Garvin, you know, he was gay as a three dollar bill. And so I walked in, <laughs> hey Terry, how you doing? He goes, Oh my boy, how are you? I said, Good. And I said, Is Bob Geigel here? He goes, Yeah, Bob's here. And so I walked over to Bob. I said, You know, Bob, I said, Let me tell you something. I love Kansas City. He goes, oh, man, that's great. You know, and he's got his glasses looking down. And I said, you know, the barbecue here is great. You know, all this other stuff's good. And I said, you know something? The only problem we got, if I'd have brought more money, I could have stayed longer. Mm. Did you get Did you get that? If I'd have brought more money, I could have stayed longer. In other words, my money was so funny, I didn't have, a pay, have enough to pay attention. And and so oh, I that, got you. Yeah, I you got, hear you. Boy, you slow, man. Are you? Dry? It's like man. And and so, let me tell you, Angelo, that that Kansas City, you know, got if if the United States needed an enema, they'd stick it in Kansas City. Well, you know, it's fun. We we've heard stories. I want to I want to uh, keep it along that subject line. Because they say when when Harley Race ran um, uh, Kansas City, Missouri, and St. Louis, uh, it was among the most lucrative time because the guys who worked got paid and they kept coming back. They drew money. It wasn't Harley they, Race. It, it was it, no, it wasn't Harley Race. Who was it? The, the most luc- the most lucrative time in the history of Kansas City wrestling. Was when Buck Robley was their booker. Oh, Buck! And Buck, Buck, yeah. Buck, Buck popped that place, and nobody booked booked St. Louis but Sam Muchnick and Larry Matizak. That was right. It. Nobody else. And uh, Sam, let me compare promoters. Sam Muchnick yeah. was was like a Paul Bosch was in Houston. You know, when you came to Houston. You knew you were gonna make some big money. Yeah. Regardless, he was a great he was a great payoff guy. Right. So was Sam Mushnick in St. Louis. You know, you you, you needed a hundred thousand of those guys. And but but it, it just it didn't work that way. But they had two strong towns that sold out all the time. And it was a pleasure for me to be able to work for those guys. It really was. Well, and I ask because we've had people on the show talked about the uh, the horrible payoffs among some of the promoters. Bob Geigel was among those people, was a great promoter, <laughs> but they say that Bob was as stingy as the day is long, but he's a hell of a promoter. And he was a nice guy on top of it. Um, but then by contrast, you've got people like Don Owens, um, that was a great promoter and a great payoff guy. Uh, Eddie yeah. Graham was was one of those people, and what and I wanted to talk about Eddie and Mike because they were among those people who understood the business because they were in the business and they appreciated the guys and paid them accordingly. Is there a fundamental difference between working for a wrestler? I mean, working for a promoter booker that was a wrestler and a promoter booker who never stepped into the ring, what's the difference? Well, well, to me, you know, uh, Eddie Graham's payoff wasn't, wasn't the greatest. And I don't know if Scott will tell you the same thing. And, you know, I was one, I was one of the top guys down there. Yeah. And, you know, my, my money was so funny, I didn't have enough to pay attention from there. And yeah. so it, it's like, it, so if you ask me about my experience, uh, well, you know, 
Eddie Graham knew the business. He had great finishes, all this other stuff, but his, his payoffs were for the shits. Yeah. And, and it, it is what it is. And, and it's not my fault. You know, he, he would, you know, squeeze them Eagles until, you know, they screamed. <laughs> and, and so it, it is what it is. I mean, you can yeah. ask Scotty when he comes on. Ask Scott yeah. Casey, you know, uh, how are the payoffs in Florida versus the payoffs in Southwest Championship Wrestling? Here's Joe Blanchard. Joe yeah. Blanchard was a good payoff guy. Now his Well, it's up. funny, Eddie, because our 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 friend here, Dan the Man, just did a uh, an exclusive one on one interview with Scott. So Scott, uh, so Dan, yes, why don't you and uh, and Eddie have a little discussion about? Uh, our mutual friend Scott Casey. You just talked to him for um, damn it two hours almost. <laughs> yeah, we had uh, we had Scott on. And I had the pleasure of talking with him, and we got to obviously you know Scott. Uh, I kind of just asked a couple of basic questions, and he had stories for days. And that's where Angelo right. started with with the with the Wahoo because I brought up that he's you know the the favorite of the show, and Karen McDaniel's a friend of the show. And he had yeah. some stories, and he had some interesting bits about the road that, you know, he talked about obviously traveling, and he said the same thing that we've heard so many times before, you know, three, four, five hundred matches a year that these these kids today right. just don't, they don't get it. You know, you, you hear, I mean, social media, some of the wrestlers today will, excuse me, sports entertainers uh, today will, um, you know, talk about, oh, this, this exhaustive schedule, I wrestled not, uh, 14 times this month. It's like, you know, wait a minute. Um, I know indie <laughs> guys that, that, that wrestle more than that. And so I was wondering if you had some some insight to kind of expand, because he really was talking about the road um, of what that was like, kind of the, the mentality of going from Texas to Florida to the, to the Carolinas to Tennessee and just traveling all around. And I'm wondering, because you you were a heel for a good portion of your run. It, it, my, I, whole, curious, my whole career. My whole career I was a heel. Yeah. Well, th now let me ask you something then, going off that, because that was something that we got into with him, was was talking about how you travel, how you book. You know, when you're uh, a big, a marquee face, it's easy to say, look, so-and-so is coming to town, you know, and, and the people want to see, you know, they, they want to see your Andres and, and Bruno when you travel and all that. As, as, a, as a heel, as someone who the fans want to boo, want to see lose, want to see get their comeuppance, does it have the same draw? Do you... Uh, and back in the territory days when you were traveling, it was that. How did you, as a heel, kind of sell yourself on being an attraction, a traveling attraction, when you're the person the crowd wants to boo? Well, number one, uh, I, uh, I always carried myself as a superstar. And when I uh, when I went in a restaurant, you know, I demanded eight tables, and and I still do today. And and so. The bottom line is this, you know, if you are a, if you, you are a star, you, you behave like a star. If you want to be star, mm. you ain't going to never, you, you'll never make it. And because you don't know what it takes to be a star. And it takes more than just showing up to be a star. And you got to live it 24-7. And I live it 24-7 to this day. And when I walk into a restaurant, I expect an A table. And, and I expect service. And, and I tip accordingly, believe me. They're, they're, uh, people that wait on me, they love, they, they'll fight to wait on me. <laughs> and it's just, it's just, you know, the way you carry yourself. And, you know, I learned that. I, I learned how to be a real superstar from Wahoo McDaniel. He That's interesting. Real, yeah. He taught me how to be a real star. Well, if you don't mind me having expanded on that a little bit, one of the stories Scott Casey told was about an event. He was talking about Lou Thez watching the, the curtain jerker matches and everything. And he said, even as champion, even as often regarded as one of the best, he said, he said, you, you can always learn something from watching the guys. I'm curious because he he implied Wahoo was a lot like that too. Always willing to learn, always willing to watch and and look. Um, kind of expand on that. When you say you learned from him, how did he work as a mentor figure for you? 
Well, you know, when I when when I he taught me into uh, leaving Atlanta, I had a good deal, you know, going in in Atlanta. I was, you know, partners with uh, Austin Idol, and then I was working, you know, um, matches, you know, angles were like Eddie Graham and I'm Ed, not Eddie Graham, Eddie uh, Gilbert, and and some of the other guys, you know, from Tommy Rich to you know, wrestling to, to, to some of the other, you know, guys, but, mm -hmm. but Wahoo, he, he saw me work and then he, he, he listened to me do my promos and I'll never forget this. He came up to me and I'm standing by the side of the ring in Georgia, you know, after I've, I've been cutting some promos, you know, for the loop. And so he walked up to me and he says, Hey, I just want to say something to you. I go, okay. He said, you remind me of Ray Stevens, Ric Flair, Dusty Rhodes, all in one guy. Oh wow! And I looked at him, and I looked at him, and I said, "I really don't know how to take that, Wahoo." I said, "I know Ray Stevens, I know Ric Flair, and I know Dusty Rhodes." Now, what do you mean by that? Do you mean the other side of these guys? Or the ring work. The, what do you mean? He goes, oh, no, the ring work. He said, that's what, you know, that I, uh, that I, I, I see in you. He said, I, and I would love to bring you to Southwest because you will sell out in Southwest. And, um, and so we kind of cut a deal right there at the ring. And, uh, and then on that, that on that coming Saturday, I think this was on a Wednesday night in Columbus, Georgia, of all places. And uh, so I think that uh, I cut a deal with him there. And then my my first uh, shot was in uh, Del Rio, Texas. That's the first sellout they had was me and Wahoo in Del Rio, Texas. And it was in 1980. And then uh, I, had, I had a deal with Wahoo that I could pick who I could do my, my angle with, plus I'd get a job guy, and plus I would do color commentary. Oh, wow. Uh, and, get myself, oh, and get myself over. That was my deal with, with the chief. And let me tell you something. If the chief tells you something, he's a man of his word. And, I, and I'm sitting here telling you that everything that Wahoo McDaniel told me came to life and more. Well, I have to tell you something, Eddie, and let me just chime in here for a second. Uh, and this is on record, and it's on our show, and Dan was actually on the show when Karen said this. Uh, and Dan, you'll remember, um, Karen told the story, and she said that when Eddie Mansfield went on television on 2020 and exposed the business, Wahoo said... My career is over. Our business is dead. And that, and you know, Dan, that's what she said. It's on record. We have it yeah. on video. How do you respond to something like that, Eddie? Well, it's awful funny. I had a few conversations for a while after that. But uh, I think what I did to the business, I made the business bigger. I it think, was always wait, can I tell you what I think if it matters to you? I think you were protecting kayfabe. A lot of well, people saying that you destroyed kayfabe. I got news for you, brother. Vince McMahon and Hulk Hogan. I said it in my intro, and I meant it. I wrote that intro, by the way. You know, Vince McMahon and Hulk Hogan destroyed kayfabe. Eddie Mansfield right. had nothing to do with that. Eddie Mansfield no, I mean, and David Schultz were trying to protect kayfabe. Well, what we were trying to do, I was trying to get get uh, health benefits for the boys and for for yeah for everybody. Yeah, for us. and uh, you know, it, and I don't want to keep re rehashing this John Stossel a little bastard, but uh, oh, fuck I, oh, he's a he's I, a, I, yeah fuck him. He's a side note. Yeah, he's a side exactly. note. But but he double crossed me. It became an ego piece for him instead sure. of doing the story. That, that compared a billion-dollar industry of professional wrestling 
to the, the Major League Baseball, NFL, you know, the NBA and the NHL. Right. You know, yeah. how they took care of their guys. You know, you know people don't understand that professional Hello? wrestlers. Yeah. Yeah. Hello? Eddie, we have a caller on the line. We have, we have a caller on the line, Eddie. I want to see Eddie Mansfield. I want that damn Eddie Mansfield on the phone now. Well, you uh, got Eddie, Eddie Mansfield. There's a, a gentleman. Yeah. Is this the continental? Is this the continental lover? It certainly is. Well, let me tell you, I've been chasing you for forty years, brother. I've been chasing you since Ethel's Gas House in Columbus, Georgia. Do you remember that, brother? Yeah, I've been there. I've been there many years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, do you remember? Who was your favorite band there, brother? Oh, hey, Randy, how are you? Randy from Brandy, brother. Randy from Brandy. <laughs> yeah. Andy, how, my, are you? how are you? I'm good. How are you? I, I, I'm doing good, my friend. Good to, good to you speak know, to you. You know, that's been, that's been over 40 years. That's how long that we started. And, you know, I, you were the biggest inspiration that I've ever had in getting into wrestling. Well, I really appreciate that, Randy. And, I mean, and you did, and just the the, the the bit of a, you know, it it, it started at, at uh, like I said, Ethel's Gas House at the old Holiday Inn in Columbus, Georgia. You come in after <laughs> matches, and I'd be and I'd right. be playing up there on Wednesday, and I knew you because I was just your biggest fan forever. And we started talking and got a relationship. And remember, you used to come over and we'd lay by the pool in the sun because you wanted to get suntan and all that. I tell you, I remember oh, yeah. so much of that stuff. Eddie, we had, oh, and I have hey, spoken I fondly girl, hey. of you since. Hmm? Hey, I remember that girl you hooked me up with from Montgomery, Alabama, remember? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I do. <laughs> And I couldn't Ooh, do nothing because my wife was there. Brother Montgomery, Alabama will never be the same. Randy, how you <laughs> hey, doing, baby? Tell you. Eddie, hey, I got to tell, tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. Angelo, I'm great. Angelo. Yeah. Angelo. I yes, got to give him. I got to give I gotta give Randy his plugs, brother. He fixed me up with nine and heavy chains. He don't go with no ugly women. No, oh, I mean, you <laughs> oh, Heavy chains. Hey, 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 <laughs> nine and heavy chains. Hey. This is one of the greatest guys I ever, ever have had the pleasure uh, of ever meeting. He is, well, he I got to tell you something, true, Eddie. True Randy's a, a dear friend of mine. He's a, a dear friend of the show. Um, I'm honored to, to call him friend. Uh, in fact, you'll see from time to time, I still wear the Randy Mania shirt on our show. I give him a shout out every time we, we can. <laughs> yes, able to. you do. And uh, and and I said, you know what? We got Eddie Mansfield coming on the show. He says, I got I, I got to come on. I've known Eddie for forty years, so, and, and I got to say hi. At least you got to say hi to him. So you know, Randy's and got you know, an open invite here, and anytime he wants uh, Eddie. So just so you hey, know, uh, that, you he's about to pop in anytime. <laughs> hey, but you but know, everybody knows Angela. Angelo. Yes, sir. You don't realize how good this guy can sing. This guy can flat ass sing. Oh, I know he's a hell of a musician. Uh -huh. He's a hell of a wrestler, too. I got news for you, brother. Yeah. Well, that's the second of all. I mean, he. I've been he a job my whole life. Hey, he actually could sing. This guy, mm -hmm. I, I used to love. I used to. That's the only reason I used to go up to Ethel's when he was there. I would go see him, and I'd get all the guys to stop in and see Randy because they were so good. They really were a great band. Oh, yes. And you. not only yeah. being a good friend, he's just a great he's just a great human being. You can't get him better than that. Oh, and, well, and I, like honor, Randy. I like Randy. I like Randy. And, you know, I can't say that uh, – I can't say enough good about Eddie. Now, I'm going back before – uh, you know, Angela, I told you my story getting started in Columbus, you know, with yeah. and, and Ed, Eddie and I, it, it, all the talks we had now and all this stuff, he never broke kayfabe yeah. on me. Never. Never right. did. Yeah. Really? So when I started, and then I started going to the gym, you know, once in a while, the Oats gym there. And, uh, of course, Eddie was, was traveling around a lot and everything. Yeah. And uh, that's how they'll show himself. But I never, he never, he always stayed in 
character. I mean, I, I can't believe the circumstances kept him from reaching his, his, well, you his know what, Randy, pure potential. It's, it's, it's funny, Randy, that you mentioned that because just before you caught, that you chimed in here, just, I mean, just seconds before you came in, that's exactly what we were talking about, you know, protecting kayfabe, protecting the oh, business. Oh, he did. Let, let he me did. have your, I want your, your heads up on it, your insight. Um, there are people on both sides of the coin. Eddie Mansfield killed kayfabe. Eddie Mansfield was protecting the boys. What do you say? Well, first of all, you're right. They didn't have the, the information out they have now. There had been other people that have broken kayfabe even before Eddie, you know, sure. Eddie did things. And, and, and like you said, a lot of people, both sides of the coin misinterpret, um, uh, maybe his intentions. Okay. He wasn't mad at the business. He was mad. Oh, no, he was, he was mad at the business part, not at the boys, not at the workers, not yeah. to hurt the business. He wanted to help the boys. Okay. And, yeah through some people that I, we won't name names, but uh, uh, there were uh, bookers at the time and the promoters at the time and things. Oh, we can um, name names. It's just a shame. Want. Absolutely. We well, can name uh, names. Vince McMahon. Well, Hulk Eddie's Hulk. favor was what? Uh, Eddie, one of your favorites was uh, Ole Anderson, right? Yeah, right. You know, you know, yeah. you know Randy, I'm going to let you talk. <laughs> and then, and then, and then uh, I'll, I'll fill in at the end. So go yes, ahead. Sir. Continue. Great. I, well, I, like I said, I don't know the stories, and, and I, I just love hearing this. But the, Eddie the person, anyways, other than, than that, like I said, he never broke kayfabe. He was 100% business. I know he went to the gym. He worked out. He kept his tan. He was a nice person. Um, even me, who's, I mean, I was, a, I was like a six-year-old fan. I mean, I was like a kid in a candy shop. I'm sitting next to Eddie Mansfield, you know, yeah. and I went that way. And now here, I was, I was like 30 years old. I wasn't no young kid, you know. Yeah. Sure. And Eddie was just so warm and open and friendly to me. I remember Eddie. You were in a, one of the magazines, Inside Wrestler, Pro Wrestling Illustrated, whatever, and there was an article on you, and you was in the hospital with your leg in a cast or something. Right. Real. Oh, I don't, I don't know what it was. And you autographed well, that for me. It. I still have it. I still oh. have it. Wow. That's cool. That's it. And then when Eddie came down to Florida, um, we were, you know, he started his little wrestling promotion, which went good. And really, I, I think, Eddie, you were the, uh, uh, you were the, the, the catapult to a couple of, of guys that really went uh, big. Uh, Billy Gunn being one of them. Uh, Damian Demento, remember the old oh IWS days? Yeah, yeah. Went that, on to the fifth. Yeah. yeah, Eddie gave them yeah, their start. And, and guy, Eddie gave them their start. And a guy by the name of RBD, and another guy I trained with Kevin Kelly. There you yeah. go, absolutely. So, uh, so anyways, when Eddie started that down here. I had a restaurant at the time, and I used to feed the boys once in a while. And actually, on the TV show, I was one of the sponsors. So this is uh, the, the the way I've developed through Eddie and had he not been yeah. an upstanding representative of the business. Okay. Regardless of all that other bullshit that people oh, talk sure. about, if he yeah. would not have been number one in the business and in my eyes as a fan, and then later as a, a small time performer, you know, I wouldn't have had these, these conversations or this relationship or feel the warmth in my heart that I still feel for him. Well, and you Eddie, know, you Randy, probably still Randy, live an hour for me. A question. You said when you when you uh, started the conversation, Randy, you said that uh, Eddie was an influence to you uh, and a kind of a role model. So what aspect of of your personality or your character, what what aspect of your wrestling persona did he influence or affect uh, the greatest in, in your opinion? Well, I'll tell you, as of right now, even. Eddie, I mean, Eddie was technically sound. I mean, old school, but Eddie was a wrestler. He could wrestle. Oh, yes. And Eddie could cheat with the best of them, okay? <laughs> but above that, Eddie was Eddie was great with a mic. You put a mic in front of Eddie's face, and he's he's going. I mean, he, he was up there with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cutting promos yeah. earlier so, tonight. So, 
Yeah. So what, what Eddie impressed on me a lot too, which some of the guys did, but, uh, but Eddie in particular, as I got to know him is the importance of the personality. Anybody can do a headlock and a, and a leg drop and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. But to get that mic to, to fill the seats without ever stepping in the ring, Eddie has that talent. And that's what I wanted to do more than anything. Okay. And luckily, you know, I really wasn't afraid of being on stage since I'd done it musically for so long. And I was that's such true. a wrestling fan. I loved it so much. But uh, personality, I guess, is the biggest thing I from Eddie. And then by the time I was getting into it, you know, he was, I think, out in Texas doing his Scott Casey thing, uh, you know, blowing up the, the West and, and out in L.A. and stuff. And yeah. uh, and I just went through the little Columbus, uh, Georgia beginnings and start and then moved on and moved around. And then, of course, Eddie was out and Eddie started promotion down here and we got together and did a little uh, at least talk in that. And then Eddie, uh, right. you were in Orlando. and. Uh, course that's where i'm at now so uh you know i just always kept in touch so when angelo told me that eddie mansfield's going to be on also i gotta be on i gotta say hi to eddie <laughs> go ahead Danny. just so you know eddie how much influence you had in me and 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 as a as a young kid as a fan talking to you right now i'm still like a little 10 year old kid <laughs> i'm just so excited <laughs> talking to you i followed your career i got your autographs your magazines the memories that I got. Um, it just, you were just such an influence all the way around. And I want to thank you for that. And hopefully we'll get together again, either at a legends lunch or something, you know, I missed the last one of them hospital, but, but anyways, that's the influence you got on a, a young fan. Who's an old busted up old man right now. So, <laughs> well, I, in fact, right now I'm looking at, I'm, I love you too. Eddie always have, and you know that. Exactly. But uh, Man, I'm sitting know. here right now looking at my ankle brace. You know, I had a full ankle replacement about uh, Man, oh a month ago. So, I'm, I'm, yeah, so I can't even put any weight on it until December and that. And you know how I did that some bitch? How? In Ted Oates' ring, learning how to wrestle, how to do leapfrogs. I'm doing leapfrogs, and I come down on the side of my ankle. Mm. And it took, oh it, my it, took it, it took it almost 40 years to get to the point where I just couldn't stand the pain no more. So I had it, wow. uh, actually they, re they replaced it. No fusion, just replaced it. You're so, just you know, anyway, you have enough fixed. about me. Oh, that's horrible. Wait, you're that's just nice. now having it fixed. Yeah. Be better late than never, I guess. Damn. Well, back then you, ahead, you didn't want to take time off, you know, and you put the, whatever kind of monkey piss they had on, they're supposed to take the pain away and nothing worked. And you, you wore braces and that. As far as wrestling, you know, you got a lot of support in them boots. Um, oh, yeah. And I had always had a brace on, on underneath that. Yeah, but see, now that I get older, arthritis started setting in. And that's what made it really, really bad. So. Yeah, boy. But anyway, so I got well, two knees, thankful to wrestling, and a new ankle, and, and uh, a triple bypass. I am good to go, man. I am ready for one more match, and I'm going to chase Eddie Mansfield <laughs> to the end of the world until I get him in here he's gonna to have to get his hair blonde again they, they get it nice and long i don't know what it's like now well it's, it's oh, real random mania is gonna run wild it's, it's, i'm hey. the continental lover <laughs> yeah if you if you'll wait about four more years it'll turn gray so i'll be honest no. you know? oh. <laughs> get that bottle remember ready. remember boys i'm older than both of you <laughs> I hear hey you. Well, you hey Randy, I want to tell you this from the bottom of my heart. Those words meant the world to me. And I really thank well, you. I really they're from you. the heart, Eddie. They are from the heart. I've always felt that way. I always will. Um, and I, I don't know what else to say, except I, I sure hope we uh, we cross paths. You know, I mean, we, we certainly live close enough if you're still here. Yeah, well, I... I uh, I, I've left. I was in Dr. Phillips Bay Hill, and uh, right. now I moved. I'm out. I'm out. I'm gonna be out. Of, I'm in Texas now, and so are you. But I'll come. But but I'm coming. Hey, I'll I'll come back. I'll be back to Orlando not not long from now, and uh, I'll call you and and we'll we'll hook up. We'll go have lunch and and you know that'd be great. I'm, I'm in water. Yeah, I'm in Waterford Lakes. 
right here at uh yeah i know where that right is right off of colonial. I'll colonial i'll tell you what i'll i'll come see you and i'll take you to lunch sound good you're gonna take me to lunch <laughs> yeah. wow eddie mansfield the continental lover is going to take me to lunch I, you can, I, I'll, I'll have to throw it up and put it in a plastic bag and keep it with my souvenirs. <laughs> I will do that. Oh yeah, Eddie, I love you. you. Andrew, you, you too. Uh, Thank you. Randy, I'm, I'll call you. I want to have you on in, in about a week, all right? Whatever, man. I can't go nowhere. I'm sitting here with my leg in the stirrup, you know? Oh, good. Then you come on here and make some people happy, all right? <laughs> I'll do that. All, all right, right, brother. Take care. Randy, Eddie, I love you. Take, take care Randy, of yourself. I'll, I'll give you a holler tomorrow, okay? All right, Angelo. Take, take love care, your show, Randy. baby. Randy, mm, hold bye-bye, guys. Everybody. Take care, Randy. Bye-bye. Eddie, we like surprising people on this show. Dan and I love getting getting people worked up. Yes, so sir. What do you yeah, you didn't expect that one, did you? No, Randy, Randy is very special. He's a real... Hey, let me tell you something. Randy's a very dear friend of mine, and he's he's very very special. He really is. He's yeah. a he he's a you know it, they don't make them better than those, that guy. They really yeah. don't. He's 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 a one in my book. Yeah, he's a real good friend of mine. He's a real good friend of the show. When uh, I was talking, Randy and I just had like kind of a a little lazy conversation. I said, "Well, I got Eddie Mansfield coming on." He went, "Stop." He goes, Eddie Mansfield, he's the reason I got into the business. I went, no shit. So tell me more. So he starts telling me, like, like he's telling me your life. I'm thinking, I got to right. have one. I got I to gotta have Randy surprise you. There so you yeah. I called him last night. I said, showtime is 730. I'm going to call you at 8. I said, pick up the phone demanding to speak to Eddie Mansfield. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so hey, we, we conspired, hey. brother. This was this was like uh, twenty four <laughs> hours in the making. But that's a good thing, because yeah. Randy, Randy, Randy's one of the guys that 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 really needs a pat on the back. He loved he loved this business oh, more God. than anyone I've ever seen. And, and you know something about it too. Hey, and let me tell you something. He he was one hell of a talent too. I oh mean, yeah, wasn't a joke. He did, a, oh, he did no. a good job, and 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 to this day, hey, you hey, you ask me about him, I'll tell you, he's damn good. He can work in the ring, and he 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 could talk, and he could yeah. do what needs to be done. And oh, absolutely, and I just love him to death. But but he, you know what I love about him? He can sing. You need to. This guy can sing. You yeah, I've never heard his music. music, to be honest with you, Eddie. Oh, you need to have him play some of his old music. Oh my goodness gracious. I'm gonna do that, Dan. That's, yeah. That's no. how come that's how come we used to go up to Ethel's gas house, you know, me and Wahoo and a bunch of others. And I wanna and I and I wanna talk about Wahoo in just a minute. But yeah. but get get some of Randy's music. But but so Wahoo said that that, that was the end of the business. Well, it it was really the only it, the beginning. And you tell you know Karen what, in a, in a that, lot that, of ways. You're absolutely right in a lot of ways. And Karen has said that, and Dan will tell you, Karen uh -huh. has said that a couple of times. And uh, you know, but she's never said it in a derogatory or like putting down manner. Right. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah, go ahead, Dan. You well, and Eddie. You know. It, um, it actually, just out of curiosity, do you happen to remember the name of the band that he played in? Oh, shit, no. Uh, I only saw him a thousand and two times. Uh, <laughs> well, well, the problem was, guys, to be realistic, now, and, and this is a truth show, isn't it? Isn't it about yes, the sir. Yes, well, sir. Well, Randy always had me this good-looking girl uh, from Montgomery. This girl was so fine. And I was single back then, so I could say, you know, and she was not in heavy chains and I wasn't even paying attention to the damn band. And, and second of all, I, you know, I could hear Randy singing, but I really wasn't paying a lot of attention to the band because I had some fine ass sitting next to me. And, <laughs> and, and, and so, 
I needed to be a paying attention to her if I wanted to get anywhere that night. You know? Yeah. So, <laughs> it was. It, hey, let me tell you, night and heavy change. Showtime. Bright lights, big city, and all the pretty ladies, as they say. You know what I mean? So, Rescue me, Daniel. That's funny. You know, um, I, I want to circle back real quick. Um, you were talking about match stories. Uh, looking up some some stuff to kind of prepare for the show and see what questions. I came across a match I was hoping you could tell me the story on because it pops up in a lot of people's memories of you, but nobody really has the narrative for it. It was a match. Uh, it was May 22nd, 1981 at the Houston Coliseum. And it was you teaming with Tiny Tom against Scott Casey and Cowboy Lang. It was a mixed regular wrestler midget match. And I'm wondering uh-huh. if you could tell us the story behind that because so many people seem to have memories of the match, but I can't yeah. I couldn't find anything about what led up to it. Like how how does that how does that come about? Well that's one of them stupid ass booking decisions. But you know, I <laughs> I, I, I don't I don't know. I'd have to watch the match. Because they had a couple of them for me and Scott, and and I I'd get heat on Scott right, and he had tagged the midget, and and the other midget would uh, the babyface midget would come in, and Lang would tag me, and I'd come in and I'd snatch that little bastard up, and I'd <laughs> slam him and do all kind of shit right, and I mean the fans would go friggin' nuts, you know, and and I and, and I and I I body slammed him. And I and I went up on that on that second rope and, and gave a, a damn elbow on that midget, and he says, "Don't do that to me anymore. You're gonna kill me." I said, "Just get up." And so I mean, I had fans literally coming next to the ringside, you know, when I jumped the midget, right? So it's like, hey. And then I picked that midget up. And only time they really took a bump over the second rope was when I gave it to them, and so. So I, I gave him, uh, I, I body slammed that midget off the top rope. <laughs> That's fun. Oh you know, Eddie, you've been compared uh, from time to time. You've been compared to, um, you know, the uh, um, the late uh, Gino Hernandez. Uh, hey, hey, you tell them people go fuck themselves. You know, uh, Gino Hernandez, uh, I could work better than Gino Hernandez. And... I could talk is, is, is better than, than Gino. Gino Hernandez did not pot Southwest Championship Wrestling. Eddie Mansfield and Scott Casey pot Southwest Championship Wrestling. I don't want to be compared to Gino, that damn half breed son of a bitch. Jeez. You know, I don't I don't want <laughs> anything to do with him. You know that why why do people though continually make that comparison? Well, the comparison should be to me and Shawn Michaels because uh, Jose Lothario that trained Shawn Michaels, Shawn Michaels copied my style. That's my style you see with, with Shawn Michaels. Yeah, that's pretty That's and, pretty obvious, pretty clear. Right. You mean you and, can't, and, and you if, can't if, really if, hide you, your if, style. And if, you, if, you, if you've noticed, what he said at the uh, Cauliflower Alley Club when he received the award, one of the top three matches he's ever seen in, 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 in the history of him wrestling was Scott Casey and myself in the hair versus hair in San Antonio, you know, in, in, yeah. in the Hemisphere Arena mm-hmm. when we, we put in over 22000 And I tried to get that damn cheap-ass, you know, promotion uh, to, to go and do a, a closed circuit with with uh, at at the Marriott on the on the riverfront, right right you yeah. know down from uh, the hemisphere, because we turned away ten thousand people that night. Really? Yeah, really. Damn. Ask, you ask turned the away ten thousand. Ask the cowboy. Ask the cowboy. The ca- uh, Scott Casey will tell you the truth. We turned away so many people. That was the toughest ticket in town, man. I heard that it would, that the, that night was almost a three hundred thousand dollar house, which was unheard of for that time in that area. Is that true? That number three hundred thousand dollar house? Well, pretty close. Um, 
it depends on what they actually turned in and what they stole. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, um, well, the average ticket price was fifteen dollars, which by today's standards, like you can't buy a nosebleed ticket for fifteen bucks. Right. But you know, yeah, you gotta remember fifteen dollars was like a lot of money for a wrestling ticket back then. So yeah, you, and, if you and, figure like say 10, 15 bucks a pop, you know, twenty two, twenty five thousand people, that's a, that's a nice piece of change, brother. Yeah. Yeah. I hope you, and, got I mean, nice, I hope you get a, your payday out of it. That's the that's the highest that's the highest grossing show they had. Buck Roby told me that. He said when he came in the book, um, you know, me and Buck used to ride together and um he said, he said that was the highest thing that they ever had. And 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 Casey and me did it. And yeah. I'll never forget Terry Funk and Dory Funk Jr. came over to me in the locker room. And you know, they're very dear friends of mine. And and they came over and said, Hey Ed, you drew this house, you know. I said, No, me and Scott drew this house. And I said, Without Scott, I, I wouldn't have been able to draw. And I said, You guys helped as well. I said it's a team effort. And, well, you uh, have I said, to I have. Really... Yeah, I mean, let, let's see, talk about that. See, Eddie. You know, like like Terry said. Terry said, "No, Ed, you and Scott Casey do this house because everybody else in this room has been trying to draw and they couldn't draw it." And he well, made a point let's there. Talk about that. That's a real great segue, Eddie, because one of the things. That bothers Dan and I, especially on the show, is when people claim to have, you know, I'm the one who put the asses in the seats, or I'm the I, 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 and me, me, me. They forget wrestling, you know, it may, on the surface, it may look like an individual sport, but it's really a team sport. Right. Because it takes two people to make a match. And uh, oh, one of the things that bothers Dan and I is when people take credit for doing all the work when it takes two people. Right. So talk to me, because you mentioned this guy's name twice tonight, and we just lost him this year, Buck Robley. So let's talk yeah. about Buck Robley. Um, what do you remember about the, the this this character, Buck Robley? Hell of a worker, by the way. Oh, as the real as thing, a guy. Now, if you were talking to Buck Robley right now, he go, yeah. Angelo, you keep me abreast, young man. You know, it's like, in other words, call me and keep me abreast, young man, on 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 every situation. Yeah. And so, but Buck, he's the only guy that I ever I have ever heard of popping Kansas City. He did that, and uh, as a booker, and he booked it. And and after Ole Anderson killed. Atlanta, Georgia, for the third fucking time. He went in and, and brought it back up, and then Ole came in back in by threatening Barnett and got rid of Buck Robley, and then it went down again. And then it, 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 at that time, me and Wahoo were, were flying in and out. I was one of the first guys, me and Wahoo, to really start flying around in Terry Funk. And, and besides Junior, he was a world champion, or Terry, what we were flying around, I was going to Detroit once yeah. a month in Toronto. You know, I was flying all over the country, so I must have been pretty damn good, guys, to, to be able to do that back in those days. Oh, and, sure. And mm -hmm. and and I look at myself, and and I, I worked hard to to get where I was. Can and, I ask you a and, question right right there, right there, Eddie? And then continue your story, because I got a question right there. How long did it take you to establish yourself as a top draw? One year. From the time you got in to the time you were number one box office. My first, my, my first year, my first year, I was rookie of the year. I was actually the only professional wrestler. That has been rookie of the year two years in a row. Hmm. How you, you explain that one? How did that happen? Well, me and David Schultz were partners, and so uh, in 1977, I was the NWA rookie of the year uh, for uh, Southeastern Championship Wrestling. Right? Oh, and okay. So, sure. mm -hmm. 
All right. So I was rookie of the year. So by N- NWA standards, I was rookie of the year. Correct. And so yep. then the next next year they opened uh, Knoxville. And so I was rookie of the year in 1978 too. So at 77 and 78, I finally looked at Schultz and I said, look, you know, I came out of baseball. You can only be yeah. rookie of the year one one time. <laughs> that That's you why know? I was asking. <laughs> And I'm going like, how in the hell did I get rookie of the year twice? See, I lived with Ron Fuller. And and uh in seventy seven and seventy eight, I think it was. Yeah. And Ron, I think the world I think the world of Ron has got one of the greatest brains in, in, in the wrestling business. He really does. And I think the world of him. Yeah. And so um, do we. You know, I talk I know I know I talk about him sometimes and you can tell him that that, and I told him before. I said, I just keep your name out there. You know, I'll I'll put heat on you just to see, put heat on you. Keep but his it, name you know, it's just like it, it's like you know. But Funny. but but you know, he came from really the first family of wrestling. Yeah. And uh, you know, absolutely. they had a monopoly on the wrestling business in the South. Oh yeah, absolutely. We have talked about it. You, you you know that Jerry Jarrett's kin to him. Yeah. Oh, I know. Ron's a good friend of mine. Ron and I talk a lot. Did you know that Jerry Jarrett came to him? Yeah. Yeah, I know Jerry too. How did, actually, how did you how did you know that Jerry was kin to him? Well, he talked about it on the show. Okay. Well, I guess you know that. Yeah. Well, no, he told like... the whole world. <laughs> right. He told yeah, the whole that, world. That, we we that, get the scoops that out that of old man. Here. Old, old man Roy. Welch was going with uh, Christine uh, Jarrett, yeah. and that's how Jerry, that's how Jerry Jarrett came about. So, yeah. in other words, you know, I it, and I and I was saying this on the show, and I, you know, I really I I shouldn't say this, and I'm not going to say it. I am just not going to say it. But uh, anyway, okay. all these people that were kin were running all these, uh, you know, territories. Yeah. And so, and if you wasn't a heel, you're in trouble. Yeah. Because there wasn't no baby face spots at all. So, you know, when me and Schultz used to travel together, we always rode by ourselves because if anything got out of that car, we knew one or the other one told it. So, you know what, you know, Eddie, Texas, you, just, you just brought up something so fucking critical, so important. That it's lost on the young people today. Let's talk about a territory. First of all, let's explain to the young people what a territory is. But let's talk about uh, when a territory is very heel heavy or what they call heel loaded. Right. A lot of people may not understand, but. The territories, especially down south, were very heel heavy because the heel could make some serious money down south. And you almost never heard of a baby face down south because it was heel versus heels match, which was like super money. That was like as shoot as you can get with, you know, still keeping it in the work. Tell people the dynamic of that. You and I need to smarten up the young Squire Daniel because he's a, he's just a pup and he may not know this, even though he tells me, Eddie, that he's the smartest guy in the room. Right, Dan? Always. Okay, so talk to Eddie. Let him smarten you up. Well, shoot. Um, it, it's, you know, it's like it, 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 we would only ride, like me and David would all only ride together because we, we didn't want any other wrestlers in the car to hear what we had to say. Because yeah. you, you you had guys like Dutch Mantel that were huge stooges, and you know there's so many other guys that were stooges, but those guys, he was really a stooge, and he was bad. And Jeez. so when when you when you look at that other other stooges, you just had to be careful because me and David were pioneer in Pensacola and pioneer in Knoxville. We were the last guys. Our crew were Ronnie Garvin and and David Schultz and myself and you know Ron and Robert and uh, Jimmy Golden 
Now that's another one. That's another cousin. Okay. Sure. Jimmy Golden. Absolutely. So you know, so they could stack a card with just their kin folks. And so it, it and so David and me were working Knoxville and Pensacola at the same time. We would be going back and forth every, you know, every week. Mm-hmm. Back and forth, back and forth. And um, and we popped that sucker and that's really the last time it really drew big was uh you know when when me and Schultz and you know Ron Fuller, Robert and uh Jimmy Golden. Um, you know, and that's when that's when Bob Roop, uh Ronnie Garvin, uh Great Malenko, uh, uh Ron Wright and all them did that K Uh yeah. You, you know, they they talked they, they talked about they never had a real match and all that. Did you ever see any of that? Have you seen that answer? Yeah, I actually have. I, I actually have, yeah, okay. sure. Have. Okay. So how in the hell are they gonna say anything about me? But uh, anyway, it 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 and and I got screwed on my show. That's the problem. If they would have yeah. done the show right, it would have came out better. But yeah, I learned a lot. I learned a lot because I I hadn't been in the TV business then. But if I'd have been in the business now, I'd have had final edit. You know. Yeah. Eddie, you know, let's like, talk you know, about. <clears throat> oh, I, I I just wanted to I wanted to uh, to uh, throw a topic out there and have uh, you and Dan discuss this. Let's talk about uh, certain areas that are southern hot spots for wrestling. You know, of course, Texas. Uh, Tennessee, Oklahoma, uh, Florida, Georgia. These have always been traditional hot spots for wrestling. I want you and Dan to explore why. Dan, go there. Yeah, we, we've touched on that on the show before. There's always seems to be pockets. If you grab, you know, uh, 20 wrestlers at random, Odds are 10 of them are going to be from Texas. You know, there's going to be a couple from Florida, a couple from Tennessee, and the rest are from New York, New Jersey. And I'm just wondering, and you travel the territories a lot, and that goes back to the black and white era. I mean, you hear stories from the 30s and 40s of the carnival shows, and they were huge in the traveling south. What is it about the crowds down there, the people down there that just draw? Because obviously you don't get wrestlers – the uh, uh, coming from areas, unless the crowd, the kids in the crowd, grow up to want to be wrestlers. What True. is it about that area, those crowds that just breed people that want to step in the ring? Good question. Well, rednecks get well. Rednecks get violent very easy. <laughs> Red, redneck. So, so that's it. Red, rednecks like to like to hit people. Well, rednecks <laughs> get violent very easy. Well, you know, if I go on TV and 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 I'm I, and I'm talking to to a guy saying, "Hey, you know good and well that your wife is looking at your fat self and and looking at me on TV and wants to be with me instead of you sitting in that lazy boy." <laughs> <laughs> well, let that's me, why oh. she's going to buy. That's why she's going to buy a ticket. Oh no, let me correct myself. This is why she's going to make you buy two tickets to watch me walk <laughs> the aisle, daddy O. That's why. Well, let, let me ask why. you something. Uh, we, we touched on it when I was talking with Scott Casey last week, that, and Angela's brought it up on the show before. Every territory in that, in that area had a cowboy character, had a Western character. Uh, yep. Yet... You know, it, it seemed like the 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 general heel was kind of molded after what you became. It was always the cowboys against the pretty boy and the flamboyance yeah. and the big hair. And it, yep. why is it that that kind of character, that pretty boy, arrogant, you know, pretty hair, handsome, cut? How, why is that such a good heel in the South? Well, I know that that that, and and and. Texas and in, in Georgia and Pensacola and Knoxville that, you know, being a, a nice looking guy doesn't hurt. And, you know, keeping yourself groomed and, and keeping yourself bathed, you know, on a normal basis, smelling good, looking good, 
and you know then women you draw the women and and you know people want to like you but you got to do something to piss them off to make them hate you and that's just the way it is and that's i, I used to lull them in and and they would want to love me so bad you have no idea and then i'd turn that knife on them so fast that it make their head swim but well, let me and let me and oh, that, I'm sorry go ahead that make that that starts drawing money and you know it not only could i work in the ring take the bumps do the high spots do whatever i needed to do but i could talk on that microphone and well, let me and let i me ask, I, 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 I would I, I i would get you as you interrupt me you know something if you were interviewing me like you're trying to interview me i would i would look at you and say before i was rudely interrupted i was trying to say this see what i mean yes yeah, so, absolutely so, so dan that that's how you get heat there's no heat now you got oh, guys no, no that, absolutely that, not that are, yeah there's no damn heat hell they're, they're more they're, they're more excited to go out to mix with the fans and sign autographs than they are being a real heel you know something well yeah it's you know like, what we just had to, that's a really good point a great great segue too dan and i eddie just had um you know one of the biggest heat seeking missiles in the business next to yourself uh on the show larry zabisco was with us and uh you know, I mean, we're talking about, you know, at the, you know, the, of course, the Larry chairs, Land, uh, baby. Larry Land. That's Larry Land. I yeah. Like, I love Larry. Yeah, so I love Larry. We talked about, Larry's you know, to, to, be, to be that hated a heel, you've got to be up against someone who is absolutely adored and beloved. And it didn't hurt his career at all that the guy who he went up against happened to be Bruno San Martino, who was. No, you know, like a saint, uh, in in the business. So yeah, I mean, it's, and it's, it didn't hurt me, Angelo. It didn't hurt me to be going against the cowboy. Exactly, uh, that looks like the Marlboro Man. Let me tell you something. Exactly, that, that, you know, and people don't understand that. You know, you you have this mindset, and you you think of the cowboy gimmick. You know, which and Dan and I actually did a whole show on the cowboy gimmick. But you have this idea, you think of the cowboy. I think of the first thing that comes to mind, the first two people that come to mind when I think of the wrestling cowboy, Scott Casey and Black Jack Mulligan. Yep. And two guys who could not be more opposite if they tried. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, when I had the IWF out of Universal Studios, Black Jack Mulligan was my world champion. Yeah. And you know, blackjack was cool, and blackjack, you know, he 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 could cut a promo, and yeah. he was a big guy. He oh was, yeah, he was six, one eight, of the biggest six, guys. Nine. Oh, he was huge. Oh and, God, yeah. You know, but I tell you that that Scott Casey, uh, for for me and him, it just clicked, and and it really worked, and we we drew money up in St. Louis too, and it's it's like. I don't know. It just worked, and and Scott, it, to this day, is is one of the most uh, underrated guys that in the history of the business, and myself as well. Well, you know, Dan they, they and I will absolutely. They, they, they hey, they hate me because of the 2020. But when you take 2020 away and you pay, you play my damn matches against anybody. I'll put my work up against anybody. Mm -hmm. I'll put you. I got news and, for you, pal. You don't have to. I'll do it for you. Right. I'll put your work up. I appreciate up that. Listen, and, I, Dane and I want to want to talk to you a little bit. Um, we've had this discussion earlier on in the show, uh, several months ago, but we want to talk a little bit about some of the history between yourself because you mentioned Universal in Florida. Uh, we want right. to talk about some of the history between yourself. And Eric Bischoff. Now, my understanding is that Eric Bischoff was trying to pick your brain a little bit 
uh, not understanding really who you were or who you are and thought that he was going to get one over on Eddie Mansfield. Can you tell, walk huh. me through that? You, you know where I'm going with this, so, and I know that you know where I'm going with this, so look, walk me through that. Right. Let's talk about the WCW slash Universal Connection. Well, I got a call um, at my office and uh, from Eric Bischoff, and they, they put him through to me. And I said, hello. He said, this is Eddie Mansfield. I said, yes, it is. He said, this is Eric Bischoff. I said, hello, Eric. How are you? And uh, he says, I, I want to make this quick. I said, okay, that's fine. I'm busy. And so he said, I, I want to bring wrestling into uh, Universal. And I said, well, Eric, Universal already has a wrestling federation. And he said, well, we'll give you Sting or we'll give you this. I said, you know something? This is in the early 90s. I said, Eric, there's nobody you got that I want because none of them will draw. I said, if you if you were drawing, you wouldn't be trying to steal my, my gimmick with putting fans in the seats out of the feed part. You would, mm-hmm. Why would you want to come to Universal uh, except to steal my idea? And I, said, exactly. and I said, you know something, Eric? I said, you know, this conversation's over. You know, wrestling, hey, I, 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 Universal already has a wrestling federation, and it's not going to be WCW. Thank you very much. Talk to you later. And I hung up. Let, and that's, let me add- that's, that's, the exact, that's the exact way it really happened. Go ahead, Dan. Let me ask you something, Eddie. You were talking earlier, and that kind of ties into it, because Eric Bischoff was one of the forces that sort of pushed that movement. Through the 70s, you had, you know, uh, your, your Bruno and, and Vern Gagne and all these guys. It was very, the heels were always hated. Yes, we could respect the talent, be it someone like you or the Sheik or somebody like that, but there was never uh, the the mass appeal. At some, even through the 80s with your your, your Rick Rudes and, and Jake Roberts, and then, you know, you, you had these guys who were booed at, but respected. Some point in the late 80s, early 90s, between like the Horsemen and the NWO and, and the rise of Steve Austin and the WWF, at some point being the heel became popular. I'm curious if you have any insight as to what changed with the crowds where, you know, if, if you had had merchandise back in, in your prime, half the crowd would be wearing Eddie Mansfield shirts and not, you know, the, whoever the face was. Um, what what changed in the crowd where where the, the the person who was booed, the person who was pushed as the villain, became cool and everybody wanted to love that guy instead? I'll tell well, you. Well, it's just kind of it's kind of like a, a Las Vegas Raider mentality, and mm-hmm. you know, you just I don't know, it, it just flipped. They didn't have the baby faces, you know, except Hogan, yeah. and you know, that was about it. I'll tell you what I think it happened if uh, if I can throw my two cents in. First of all, Dan mentioned something, Eddie, that's very important. He said, talked about merchandise, the heel merch. You know it's old school as, as I am, and, and you and I are probably old school. The heels never, never had merch. It was always the baby face that had merch. Heels never had merch. But I think it changed, and I could probably pinpoint the moment. Uh, It goes back to probably Steve Austin, Bret Hart, uh, in that I Quit match. The the moment that Bret bloodied uh, Steve Austin and made him say, I quit, that was the the turning point. Because Bret was the baby face going in, and he was the heel coming out. Mm Mm-hmm. And there was no obvious healed baby face turn, no clear turn. It's the crowd that felt sympathy for Austin mm-hmm. that made him the baby in that match. Would you agree with that, Eddie? Well, absolutely. 
uh, and you know, keep telling those stories. Tell two or three more stories and link it really in because you're almost there now. Okay. Um, what am I missing? Well, I mean, then you then you then you start looking at Undertaker. Then you start looking at it. At, at oh, I else. got you. Okay, I got you. I see where you're you going. What I mean? Okay, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it, it's always been again. It's always been told to me that if you're a heel, you never sell merch. You never sign autographs if you're a heel. If you're K. Fabin, a heel character. You don't want to sign a kid's autograph. You want to tell him, go away, you little rotten squirt or whatever. You know, that's a true heel. Like Chris Jericho told the story that used to break his heart when he got home, but he would be in an elevator with a young fan and he would ignore him. He'd, you know, push his autograph paper away. But he he was the heel and he faved it from the moment he arrived to the time he left. And he was that character at every moment he was in public. But when you do that, is there a psychological uh, weight that's added to your to your daily day? Uh, or do you just have to like decompress at some point? Well, what I used to do is uh, I would make his uh, autograph more valuable. Uh, when when I'd have kids come up to me or catch me somewhere, yeah. I'd go, yeah, no problem. I'll sign it for you. And then I'd go, you know, best of luck, Scott Casey. And then I hand it back to him. Oh, Jesus. So, <laughs> go ahead, Dan. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it, 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 his, his autograph is really more expensive now because it was Eddie Mansfield that signed Scott Casey's name. Oh, for so, God. <laughs> That's too funny. By the yeah. way, I should tell, I'm sorry, Dan. I, no, I, go ahead. I, I promise you, I, I'm not used to interrupting you, but um, <laughs> I promise you. We, I, I want to tell everybody now. While they still have here, Eddie Mansfield will be joining us again. And he will be joining us with Cowboy Scott Casey. I am going to reunite Mansfield and Casey together again on Wrestling with the Future. And these guys are going to talk about their careers, their matches, the uh, the money that they made, uh, the territories that they created. And in some cases... At one case I know of, if you want to talk about it, Eddie, a territory that you and Scott actually saved from folding up. You want to talk about that? Well, tell me which one would that would be. I, I believe that would be Southwest. <laughs> I just wanted you to hear. I just wanted you to say it. <laughs> yeah. What a, what a dick movie. <laughs> Oh, it's like, hey, look, if you hey. say go for it, I'm going to go for it. <laughs> yeah, go for it. That's it, baby. There you go. Yeah, and absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I heard that Southwest was pretty well in the shitter. Yeah, it, 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 was, it was pretty, you know, it wasn't good. That's why Wahoo told me coming in from Atlanta and in and, and the Southwest, you know, they yeah. were pushing Tully Blanchard and Tully Blanchard couldn't draw two two knobs of goat shit. Well, that's kind of so. where I was. I'm thank you for going there because Eddie, that's where Dan and I want to go right now. Joe Blanchard, okay. they say was a hell of a promoter, but he made the mistake of putting Tully as the booker. Well, was he that wasn't his the booker, mistake or. But, but he is, wasn't the booker oh. at, at when I came in. Wahoo okay. McDaniel was the booker. Oh, Wahoo. And, okay. But I can tell you what. I was at the booking I, I, every Tuesday morning. I was with Wahoo booking, and Tully Blanchard would call at ten thirty every Tuesday morning, begging for his belt. And so here's what I did to get me and Casey a, a top spot. I had Wahoo tag up Gene Hernandez and 
Tully Blanchard. And then that way, it left a spot for Casey and me on top. If not, uh, Tully Blanchard would, would, would take the top spot because he is daddy on the territory. See what I mean? Right. Well, you so know, uh, that, that way, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I, I, I thought you were finished. I apologize. No, I'm, I'm done. Well, you know, let me let me kind of have you expand on that. You were brought in as as a heel. It goes to what Angela was talking about earlier, where where the heel is the one that brings brings the money. You know, you I, I guess maybe kind of expand on that. You had uh, people that were being pushed, these big baby faces that were uh, as as my my uh, uh, Jim Cornette used to say, couldn't couldn't draw money if you gave them green paper and a marker. Uh, you know, you couldn't um, that 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 you came in and and you were able to just because the crowd was so invested in watching you lose, it elevated the faces around you. Kind of put us in that mindset because the common conception and it's a misconception as as we've touched on among fans is it's the faces. You know, anybody any heel that goes against Bruno uh, Bruno San Martino is going to get elevated. Any of the AWA heels that got in the ring with Vern Gagne were elevated. When in fact, in most of the territories, the faces were elevated by the heels who had to shoulder the burden. I was wondering if you could kind of expand on that. Oh boy. Um, well, what was really cool about, you know, me, I had enough, I had a lot of uh, publicity out of magazines and rated in the top 10 and most hated, you know, and then, uh, me and bad, bad Leroy Brown were top 10 tag team. Um, uh, you know, I was in the top 10 for the, you know, the world's belt and, and that helped, you know, with the fans. And then when I started in, and and doing my thing it just got over and it got over because i made sure it got over and you just can't show up see they tried to follow me with bobby jaggers well bobby jaggers ain't even the same class i'm in i'm just telling you i mean when i left uh southwest championship wrestling they tried to bring you know have jaggers take my spot well, mm-hmm. you can ask Scott Casey. Bobby Jaggers was no Eddie Mansfield. And yeah, you know, actually, Scott has talked is. about yeah, Eddie to to validate that point, Eddie. Scott's been on the show, and he's talked about that that run that he had with uh, with Bobby Jagger. And he doesn't speak fondly of it, to be honest with you. You know, he uh, I have a feeling that was one of those things that Scott did. Just because he had to and get it out of the way, but we get the Dan and I kind of got the feeling that he just is rather soon not have had to deal with uh, with Bobby Jaggers at all. Was he? Well, was he? he couldn't. Well, I was going to well, say because I, I heard after, he couldn't work. Well, after following me and selling out everywhere, and then you go with this guy who couldn't sell out the damn uh, fucking Sagin. You know, with with three thousand people. So mm-hmm. I mean, you know, yeah. you mm-hmm. go from selling out arenas at, at twenty two and twenty three thousand to eighteen thousand yeah. to to you know all over Texas, Beaumont yeah. to, to everywhere. I mean, you, cool. you just name it. Wherever they 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 put it on the map, we sold out. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I'll tell you a story. Oh, Jerry Briscoe called me up. You know, Bobby Jaggers was known for lying a lot. You know, you know he. We we heard he was a. Uh, we heard Bobby Jaggers was an office stooge. <laughs> yeah, on top of that, but if yeah. his lips were moving, he was lying, right? Oh Jesus! <laughs> so, 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 so Jerry Briscoe calls me up one morning. He goes, "Hey Ed," I go, "Yeah." He said, "You know, Bobby Jaggers died." I said, "Well, I'll be damned." I, I said, Jerry, I guarantee you that his ass is in heaven right now, lying to God. <laughs> oh, oh, man. man. <laughs> and that damn, hey, J- Jerry just like died laughing. Well, it's true. He's up there lying to God. I guarantee you. Well, let, let me let me kind of uh, 
finish the finish this narrative out. I look at, at See, you mentioned Dan, earlier, you know why I'm a heel now because I you know it, it's just the way it is you know. Well, let, let me let me finish this narrative out. You mentioned earlier obviously your obvious influence you had on Shawn Michaels' career, his character. When he was when he evolved from the rocker Shawn Michaels to the the Eddie Mansfield knockoff, it, it was hugely over. And a lot of the the heels in the in the nineties into today took their inspiration from the territory days. Some of yeah. the biggest heels of your generation are literally shot for shot. There's remakes of people that are over today. But if you take Tully Blanchard. And, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm a huge fan. He's one of the pictures behind me. Uh, it, you put him in today's market, he's not over. You take somebody like a like well, a he wasn't, Gagne, he wasn't over then either. So it I, don't I, matter. What I mean is, is the, the territory face doesn't translate to today's crowd, but the territory heel would be over this today the same way you were back then. What is it about the 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 heels? Like like what you did that that's generational versus the the cowboy clean cut high in the saddle face of the seventies and eighties that just doesn't doesn't sell today. Well, well, number one, you're wrong. Not, uh, it, it, I guarantee you, if I booked WWE for one year and I brought back uh, the cowboys, I brought me back two cowboys, then I brought me back an Indian. Right, and 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 then I brought me back a blonde guy. Then I I brought back uh, some two two big old uh, guys that, that that was a great tag team together, and and I put them together. I guarantee I draw money. Well, because you're doing something. Reason, Think about what the you only just reason, said. Though. Yeah, but but the only reason they're not drawing now they. It is all vanilla. You well, have no characters exactly, anymore. And that's, I was just going to say to you, think about what you're saying, Eddie. You're talking about characters. There are no characters. There are no... The, the easiest thing in the world to be in wrestling is a heel. And you know why? All you got to do is be honest and tell the lady in the front row that she's fat and ugly. <laughs> That's all you have. I mean, am I lying? This, this no. is psychology 101. This is wrestling yeah. psychology. There's a, there's a lot more to being a heel than that. You gotta you gotta be well, able to call I, I'm them giving out. you the reader's get, get digest. Stuff over. But but yeah, I'm telling I'm you, 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 the just can't, you can't be a, but yeah, yeah, you but can't be afraid. What you're saying is let's bring back the characters. They're, yeah, everybody's right. vanilla because they're a fr first of all. They're afraid to rock the boat. They're afraid to be politically uh, uh, insensitive. You 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 want to be politically insensitive. That's what wrestling is. It goes against the grain. It's uh, it's the uh, the catharsis for the working man. He mm. wants to tell his boss to go f himself. He wants to do exactly. all that. You know, absolutely. That's and, and, I get on my soapbox and then I'm just showing how. Fucking old I really am, you know. <laughs> but it's but true. Here's I mean, a segue and, and for you. You ready for this segue? You're gonna love this, Eddie. Do you have sweaty <laughs> balls or volleyball no, ready I, balls? I, I, it's no, time I to don't. make them I, ready balls. The Manscaped right. Lawnmower 3.0. This <laughs> I got a big filter. <laughs> the Lawnmower 3.0 is uh. It will do the job and clean your knob with its patented no nick head. It will function as desired, so your your head will work as desired. And uh, Dan, <laughs> all I'm seeing is your balls will thank you. Put that box down, <laughs> Dan. Take Man, me out that, of the that, spot. <laughs> yeah, that's that sounds like Margaret out of Houston. Man, you know, it, yeah. it, well, Eddie Eddie talked about earlier about saving the business, and, and Angela was just bringing up our sponsor, which is uh, really important because it saves the most important thing on you, and that's 
uh, you know, your boys, especially in this kind of weather we've been having. And from manscaped.com, you can use promo code wrestling future for 20% off their current package. They have the uh, lawnmower 3.0 comes with the ball deodorizer, the ball spray, uh, a, a replacement head plan and uh, a series of, of wipes that, that are, are uh, out now, as well as various other products. They, they have a wide array of, of products you can check out for all your manscaping needs. Manscaped.com, promo code Wrestling Future for 20% off. And uh, like I said, with the sign, manscaped.com, your balls will thank you. There you go. Hey, and How's I can, that for I a segue? Actually, I, I can genuinely say that you guys are nuts. <laughs> you know? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, Eddie, I'll but tell you, you talk, what. We're gonna, but, we're but, say... but you know something, Angelo? Yes, sir. When you, when you, let me finish my thought. It, yes, sir, that, please. Yes, you, sure. you know, we're, we're bringing in, you know, the gimmicks like they used to be. And and yeah. what what they failed to do, they they got all these uh, dumbass writers who's never been in the ring and, and all this other stuff. And Absolutely. instead of letting the guys do their own promos and be their own, you know, uh, personality. And, Thank you. And you, you know what's going what, – see, they're trying to put everything into a month. Each month they have to create something new. Well, they're not talented enough to do that. And, 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 and here's what I would do. Here's how, you remember how we used to do the angles and they would last six months? I would sure. run an angle. Oh my God, yeah. I would shoot an angle on top and run that six months. And if it ran through SummerSlam, if it ran through this, it ran through that. So be it. And then with my tag belts, my intercontinental belt, and you know, uh, TV belt, I'd run all my angles all the way through until they wouldn't draw. And then I'd start building guys underneath to take their place. And that's, that's the problem. Do. Eddie, you're exactly right. That's the problem. Nobody knows today how to run a program. For they, they, they can't run a program. There are, there are no angles. There are no characters to, to bring forward angles. You've got no personalities left. Where are the, per the, the last great character that WWE had? They took a giant shit on him and they let it die. The Fiend. That was, you know, Bray Wyatt's Fiend. The, you know, just, uh, uh, what do they call it, Dan? The Firefly? The Firefly Flun uh, Fire oh, Funhouse. Funhouse. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Okay. At least such as it was, it was a character. You know, Bra even, right. you know, Bray Wyatt and the Wyatt family. Or you even had, you know, uh, Shades of the Undertaker, for crying mm -hmm. out loud. You know, yeah, they, they took a guy like Brody up. Lee and did absolutely nothing with him in AEW, thank God, picked him up and they're doing something with Brody Lee. Yep. Well, he, right. He's a guy, very much, if you look at Brody Lee, very much a throwback to, uh, to Frank Bruiser Brody, one of our favorite people here. Yeah. Because right. Barbara's a dear friend of the show. Barbara Goodish is a dear friend of mine, great friend of the show. Uh, and by the way, yeah, and, ask uh, her, next, next time, next time you get Barbara on, yes, sir. ask her about that crazy Buck Roby, and she'll have a thousand stories about him. I oh, mean, I'm Buck, sure she does. Some. Yeah, Barb's going to be coming back on with Karen, and uh, we're going to bring the wives back again. We, uh, Dan and I, you'll appreciate this, Eddie. We did a show with Wrestling Wives. We had uh, Jimmy Snooker's wife, Carol. We had Karen McDaniel and Barb Goodish. And that was a yeah. hoot. I want to tell you what, brother. I think Dan and I maybe said five words the whole show. <laughs> that's yeah. good. Well, you know, that's kind of like being at home, Angelo. You don't ever get to talk. <laughs> You're pretty much right. About that. <laughs> You're pretty much so, right about hey, that. Well, hey, I'll tell you what, hey, I know what. Hey, hey, I know. I know when I'm at home, I don't say but about two or three words, yes or no. That's it. You know? That's it. You and I never, it. I never say no. I usually say yes, you know. So that's exactly. how that works. Well, listen, my friend, I'm going to have to let you go. We're going to bring you and Scott back in a couple of weeks for uh, Mansfield and Casey reunited. All right? So well, uh, any good. parting and, words and before I, I let you go? Anything to plug? Well, any, uh, anything to promote? Whatever you want. 
Yeah, well, I got I got two shows that we're going to be doing uh, coming up. Uh, the original uh, Country Gold were Rowdy Yates and Tex. The company keeps. That's what I'm going to be doing. That's my next two uh, series coming yes. out, and uh, I'm really excited about it. And I appreciate you know you guys having me on the show. I love you to death. And oh, uh, we love you. You you have quickly become one of our favorites here, Ben. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, I hope I entertained you enough tonight, you know, and uh, and I hope I entertained the fans, and that's Absolutely. the key. And, yes, sir. You know, for all you fans, all you fans listening, you know, always remember, wrestling is is going to make a bigger comeback than it was before, and and always look back at, at, at some of the guys like myself and Casey and and. Wahoo and and Brody and and Buck Robley, and you'll see how the business in Blackjack Mulligan, that was the way the business was really done, yeah. and give these guys uh, a a shake, you know, with AEW and WWE, give them a fair shot before writing them off, because you never know when they're going to make that right turn, and things are going to be just as great as it was before. And I, I want to thank you for listening. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you, Eddie. God bless you. Have a great night, my friend. Eddie Mansfield, everybody. Yes, sir. Thank you, Eddie. Take care. All right. Good bye night, bye. Eddie. Bye bye. Daniel, that was uh, a, a never a dull moment with Eddie right? Mansfield. I think we finally met a guy that interrupts you more than I do. <laughs> You know, we we always say we love the uh, we love the guests that you just point them in the right direction and they can talk forever. I'm gonna I tell mean, you what, man. Scott Casey and Eddie Mansfield. Oh, oh, oh like I, I said, that show. Right. Have, you make sure that your wife has plenty to drink for you sitting on the sidelines. Uh, I was about to say. Are you um, I mean, you can get your work done. You can drink some coffee. You can have a <laughs> meal. I was just you about might to, get say, to ask a question. Are, I, are, are you, I was about to ask, are you even going to need me for that episode? Short of short of hello and goodbye, what, yeah, what words are much, we going to yeah. get? I might need you to do the Manscapes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Don, that was a great interview. I love Eddie Mansfield. I tell I'm you gonna... what, and I, he genuinely seemed to be happy to hear from Randy Hogan tonight. Yeah, well, and you could tell in Randy's voice, like he, he actually started getting emotional. Like that was a yeah. real... That was a real bond, and and you don't. Yeah. That's another thing, and and a lot of the guys we've had on have talked about that. Is that's something? Even Brian Pillman Jr. touched on it. You know, being younger, that's you don't have that bond among the guys today. Well, you know, you got to remember something, Dan. Especially the old school guys. These guys used to spend more time with their work partners than they did their domestic partners, their wives and, you know, husbands and wives and, and you know, uh, significant others. They spent more time in the car with each other going from places, you know, they used to share the yeah. same hotel rooms and sometimes, you know, eat in the car or eat on the run or yeah. whatever the case may be. But they spent, you know, look, uh, you know, Karen, Karen McDaniel really gave us kind of the, the the bird's eye view of that one, you know, uh, when the when the boys have to take you home because you're too drunk to drive, and you can't stand up. You remember the night she said that uh, Roddy Piper took her home, uh, yeah. took um took Wahoo home, and uh, you know said you Mrs. McDaniel here. This is your does this belong right. to you? <laughs> yeah. I think it's look, what look what, look Piper what I found said, in does, the parking lot. I think it's yours. Yeah. Does, <laughs> Exactly. Yes. Well, I mean, but yeah, think about it. They spent a lot of time with each other back in the day. Yeah. I mean, that, that was, these, you know, and, but these guys now, at least I'm going to, I'll say that I'll qualify it Dan, by saying this and you can correct me if you think I'm wrong. Um, the guys on that you see on television are spoiled. I think they've got too much. They've been given too much. They haven't worked for it. They haven't earned it. The guys that are working the indies, though, that are getting in their cars and driving from place to place, old school style, those guys like Brian Pillman Jr., those guys like Teddy Hart, 
that are, you know, even though they have names, are still paying their dues, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, Brian's not afraid to take an indie job anywhere. Right. He'll work for a hundred bucks. He don't care. Because he knows he's got a contract with the uh, um what is the MLW, right? Yeah, and he's been he's been popping up on the uh the dark, the AEW uh internet show. He's yeah, been he's been and you're gonna see him. I think you're gonna see him because they're getting ready to offer him a contract. Oh and yeah. I think that's pretty well given. And yeah, we I, said that even on this show. Yeah, and know? well he he mentioned he mentioned to us that he had uh a premiere coming up that he couldn't he wasn't wasn't allowed to talk about yet and well, then what not not two weeks later he he was on AEW dark for the first time yeah and he uh, yeah he couldn't talk about it but we saw it we absolutely saw it and and god bless him and good for him because if anybody deserves it this kid deserves it he's a a nice guy he's a genuinely nice guy Mm-hmm. He will, by the way, be coming back. Brian Pillman Jr. will be coming back. Yes, sir. I just I I, I hinted toward the beginning of the show. We have a uh, a lot of return guests coming back, uh, and boy, do we, including Tombstone Jesus, Lanny Pafo, um, Magnum TA is coming back. Um, oh God, Eddie Mansfield, Scott Casey, of course. To, to those two, forget about it. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and, and a number of people, Vince Russo, we talked about Vince, Vince will be back. Um, I actually talked to Vince last night awesome. and, uh, yeah, good guy, really good guy. I would love, I would love to be able to get, if you know anyone, Dan, reach out amongst your spider web of connections. I'd love to be able to get Eric Bischoff on the show. Oh man. So that's your task, my friend, oh, in between uh, your 70 hours, <laughs> on your lunch break, check it out. Um, yeah, I'd love to get Eric Bischoff on the show, even if I got him for like a half an hour. Right. Just to get him to say uh, hello or fuck off, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to have him on. So, uh, Dan, anything to promote? Anything to plug? Anything to plug? Well, I mean, we've got, <laughs> come on, I've been doing this long enough. Uh, obviously, we, you know, uh, on the YouTube channel, Wrestling with the Future can also be found on Twitter at Wrestling Future. That's no G. We're on Instagram, Wrestling with the Future. We have uh, anywhere podcasts can be listened to, Wrestling with the Future podcast. We continue to grow and expand on that front. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, um, all the links, we've got the the wonderful T-shirt that Angelo is sporting right now. And anywhere, anywhere we can be found on social media, wrestling with the future. Uh, we've got a bunch of great guests coming up, a bunch of shows coming up, and we're going to continue to grow, continue to do our thing, and have fun with it. Absolutely. For Dan the Man Sebastiano, the Happy Haberdasher. I'm Angelo DeCipio. As always, till next time, happy wrestling, and we'll see you later. Bye bye. Good night, everybody. <laughs>